Good morning, brothers and sisters. What a great joy to be at this wonderful, grace-filled event. The Divine Mercy is one of my, I would have to say, favorite next to the Rosary devotions. And I have to say that in the years that Father Kevin and myself have ministered um, around the world, it is amazing how this uh, devotion, this beautiful um, devotion, St. Faustina being uh, known as the Secretary for Jesus of Divine Mercy, she did a wonderful, a wonderful job. Because I was thinking as we were sitting here, you know, we, we had some years ago a conference of divine mercy in no other than Nagasaki in Japan. And we had lots of Buddhists came and people were looking at us. It was a mixture of charismatics and Buddhists. And Japanese, you know, are not known to hug, but boy, were they happy. They were so, they just love this whole concept of the mercy of Jesus. So today and tomorrow, we're going to have a grace-filled weekend. And you know, in, in reading the diary, I was just praying on it and asking the Lord, you know, to, to put the word. And this is from uh, the, the diary where Jesus said to Faustina, I desire that you know more profoundly the love that burns in my heart for souls. And you will understand this when you meditate upon my passion. Call upon my mercy on behalf of sinners. I desire their salvation. When you say this prayer with a contrite heart and with faith on behalf of some sinner, I will give him the grace or her the grace of conversion. And we say the prayer together. You know it. O oh, blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a fountain of mercy for us, I trust in you. O oh, blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a fountain of mercy, I trust in you. O oh, blood and water, which gushed forth from the heart of Jesus as a fountain of mercy for us, I trust in you. Lord Jesus, I consecrate this weekend to your divine mercy, to your sacred heart. I pray, Jesus, that you will pour out your mercy, your healing, your love, your compassion into all of our hearts. We offer you our human hearts today, and we ask you to penetrate them with your grace. Fill us, Lord, with all the attributes and graces of mercy. And we pray to you, St. Faustina, that you would intercede for us as you were the one chosen to spread and to make known in a new and in our time the mercy of Jesus. So we ask you, St. Faustina, with Mary, our mother of mercy, that you would intercede during these days, that we may fulfill the promises that Jesus, and it receive the promises that Jesus made. We ask all of this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. And I, I'm very blessed because, you know, I'm, I know the sisters in Krakow very well, and many years ago, I think before the relics started becoming very difficult to get, I was given a piece of Faustina's bone, so I have her up here beside me. I'd like to, in this morning's um, first sharing to share with you on the power of divine mercy, but it's beginning with three things, faith, forgiveness, and mercy. And today we know, brothers and sisters, we're living in an age when our faith is being tested. And we certainly see it around the world where Christians, our brothers and sisters, as Pope Francis said a few days ago um, when he was speaking to the English um, or the Scottish Protestants who came to see him, which was a wonderful thing, and he, he talked about that we are living in an age when we as Christians uh, have to recognize that the blood that runs within all of us 
he was saying to them, whether Protestant or Catholic, Coptic, um, whatever, all of us who believe in Jesus Christ are under ferocious attack. And it's very easy. It would be easy, even though we're scared at the thought of it, you know, to be like some of those Christians in Nigeria and in Syria or wherever, just to die, get your head cut off, be killed for Christ. That's red martyrdom. And it may come to, we know it has been in our land, we know that Ireland soaks with the blood of martyrs. But we also know that white martyrdom takes faith. What does it mean? It means that we have to live every day being confronted with those who are enemies to the cross, those who mock what we believe, those who try to enshrine laws that, and replace the commandments of Jesus and the commandments of God with human commandments. And so we are living in a time when we need to know our faith, but human faith is what rules much of our world today, and especially our own country in Ireland, in England. Human faith, which means that we believe, people believe what they hear on television, what they read in the newspapers, what people say. Whether it's gossip, whether it's we slander, destroy others, or whether it's against our Catholic faith as Catholics. And people believe it. People say things about, we see it all the time, about people and we believe it. Or as I live in the United States quite a bit of the time, people will say things like, well, you know, it's, it's, it's legal. You can have an abortion, it's allowed. And people don't realize that there are many martyrs in England all over here who died because they would not adhere to what the laws of the land were. So this is why human faith is spiritual suicide. When you believe, when you don't have a living divine faith, you become dead. And that's why for us who are Bless, thank God, with this beautiful call to spread the mercy of God, to, to believe in Jesus' mercy, to trust in Jesus, no matter what the circumstances, no matter how bad things are. When we trust, we are a witness. And this is why our Holy Father talked about, you know, evangelization with the joy of the gospel. Joy doesn't depend on circumstances. Joy depends on our belief, our divine faith. Divine faith is what Jesus gives us through baptism. God, when you're baptized, you and I receive this wonderful gift. And thank God for those of us who, whose parents nurture that faith through the sacraments, through family prayer, through the teachings of the church, through the, the guidance of the Holy Spirit working in our parishes, that's where divine faith grows. It grows through prayer. And what do you hear all the things that Jesus said about faith, divine faith? These are the promises. He, he kept telling the people, and he tell us today in the midst of our confrontation with evil and the enemy, do not be afraid. It is I. I am here. Do you remember what he said, and I quote it all the time, out of the diary of Faustina? I'm not an object. I'm a person. We have the person of Jesus. Why should we be afraid? We, above all as Catholics, have Jesus' body, blood, soul, and divinity. He said, he was, in another part of Scripture, it says, he was amazed at their lack of faith. And he told Faustina, he said, but for me to be able to act 
upon the soul, the soul must have faith. Oh, how pleasing to me is a living faith. He said, when he was at, the people begged him for healing. We'll have a healing service tonight. And Jesus would say this to you too. Do you believe I can do this? Are we convinced? He said again, all things are possible for those who believe. He said, if you had faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, you could say to this mountain, move, and it would move. He means that there are things that are humanly impossible, but for God, nothing is impossible. And the wonderful thing about divine faith is that when the time comes for us to be tested, that faith comes into action like a giant. And a few days ago in Florida, Father Kevin and myself, I was at prayer in adoration, and the Lord gave me a word. I was praying very much for those 21 uh, Coptic Christians who were beheaded, you know, all kneeling, you see them there. And I got a very strong sense that we should call into the Coptic church. We have a Coptic church um, it's not under Rome, but a wonderful church down about maybe half a mile from us. And I just had this sense as, as, a, as a Catholic, but as a Christian. So Father Kevin and, and Jackie, my secretary, our secretary, and myself went down to the Coptic church. And we had a wonderful meeting with the priest there. And you know, when we, were, we prayed with him, we talked to him, he talked to us about the suffering. And he was himself from Egypt, but now in America as a pastor. One of the things that was a great consolation to those um, Coptics around the world is that when those men were beheaded, they were crying out to Jesus. They were, they were calling on Jesus. They trusted in Jesus. And that's a wonderful consolation because as our Holy Father said to their holiness in the Coptic church, they're martyrs. They're, they're, they're automatically in heaven. Everyone who dies for Jesus, for the truth, who, who lay down their lives for the moral teachings and truths of the faith. Why are they doing it? Because they have faith in Jesus and in his gospel. Jesus said, Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. So I would say to you, Pray today and during this day that your divine faith will grow. Exercise it. This is why the sacraments and why the divine mercy is such a powerful devotion. Because what it does, it draws us to the very heart of mercy to meet the Jesus in confession. Think of, think of the power. And Jesus spoke about this to Faustina constantly the power that coming to a Jesus who loves us you know when you look at Jesus his heart is full of mercy and compassion for sinners that's why he came not only have we this sacrament of confession to help us our faith to grow and to keep the enemy out of our lives now some months ago I got, you know, I, I always tried to go to confession at least once a month, but about um, four or five months ago, again at adoration, I got a word from the Lord telling me that I had a vision of a garden, and I was really begging the Lord for my own sinfulness to help me, and the Lord showed me a garden with flowers, lovely flowers, and then weeds, and then he revealed to me that the only way to get rid of weeds before the takeover is for the gardener to pull them out and to keep pulling them out and eventually the roots will die. And he said to me, but I want you to go more. Come to me more. Come to me often in this sacrament. So I made a commitment to go to confession every two weeks. And you know, sometimes we think it's not easy, but I have put my guardian angel in charge. And I say to the guardian angel, now this is Saturday, find me a priest and find me if I'm traveling. And it's absolutely amazing but that is a wonderful way for keeping our faith growing for divine it gives you grace it fills you with the grace to keep going to the next one because you know we're all sinners there's no none of us here saints we're in the making we haven't reached 
but we have to keep exercising this faith, clothing it with all the mercy and grace, letting it flow through us. Then we have mercy and forgiveness. The theme of today is forgive us our trespasses. You know, it's not easy to forgive on our own. And people say, well, I'll, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget. And it is true that, you know, people get worried, all of us, even when you, you know, um, somebody hurts you deeply. And you don't lose your memory. When you see the person, you may remember it. But you know what, you know what mercy will do when you keep coming to Jesus and, and the Divine Mercy Chaplet, saying the chaplet, what it does is like when you have an operation. It takes the, the, the wound. When you get an operation, you have a very sore scar, wound. But in time, that wound heals. The scar remains. It doesn't do you a bit of harm. You can touch it. You can... It's the same with this forgiveness. When we beg the Lord, Lord, please give me the grace to forgive somebody that hurt me. Give me the grace to, to be kind to a person maybe, maybe I work with, you know. The biggest problem in the world is not, you know, we, we're always saying, you know, if everything was perfect, but we're not perfect. We are sinners. We have the roots of original sin. So we're always stepping on each other's toes or we have all those characteristics that are, are not, we want to get rid of. Well, if we keep praying, this, the, the hurt or the anger or the hatred will melt. We may remember it and we'll be able to meet the person with love, just like, I mean, I'm sure Peter, when he met Jesus that day and Jesus looked at him, with those eyes of forgiveness and mercy. Do you not think Peter remembered, I'm after denying Jesus? But that was taken away. And Peter was able to fulfill God's will because he accepted the forgiveness, because he let the hurt, because he let the guilt go. We have to never, ever forget the words that Jesus spoke. He, he said to Faustina about the chaplet. The Chaplet of Divine Mercy, which I tell people all the time to say. The Chaplet of Divine Mercy can change the hardest sinner. It can change bitterness into peace, joy. The Chaplet has been, Jesus has promised. He said, uh, the, the, the words of him here was, when I enter the chapel for a moment and the Lord said to me, My daughter, help me to save a certain dying sinner. Say the chaplet that I have taught you. When I began to say the chaplet, I saw a man dying in the midst of terrible torment and struggle. His guardian angel was defending him, but he was, as it were, powerless against the enormity of the soul's misery. A multitude of devils are waiting for his soul. But while I was saying the chaplet, I saw Jesus just as he was depicted in this image. The rays which issued from Jesus' heart enveloped the sick man, and the power of darkness fled in panic. The sick man peacefully breathed his last. When I came to myself, I understood how very important the chaplain was for the dying. It appeases the anger of God. It is a wonderful, calming effect. And I want to tell you, I'm going to talk to you about two beautiful testimonies of mercy. Because, you know, the testimonies are the most wonderful way of getting across, as you know. These are both um, testified to the divine mercy. There was a priest in the United States who... One day he got a call. He was a priest who was ordained about seven years. He lived in Boston. He got a phone call from his um, family who lived over in San Francisco. And they informed him that one of his 
cousins was dying and he wanted the priest to come and see him. They were good Catholics, but he was related, so they thought it would be lovely because he had a fatal disease. So Father Jim flew out from Boston, if any of you know, to San Francisco. It's as far away as America is to Ireland. Anyway, when he arrived at the hospital, he was dressed as a priest. And there was a little nun standing at the door of the hospital. And when she saw him, she said, Father, I'm so delighted. I am so glad you're here. And he was kind of surprised because he, didn't, he wasn't from there. He thought, does she mix me up with somebody else? And then she said to him, I want you to do me a big favor. I really am desperate. She said, there's a man in Ward 4, and he's dying. He's bitter. He's angry. And every time a priest comes in and he sees the Roman collar, he starts screaming at him to leave. And they leave. But she said, listen, Father, he's going to die very soon. So please, please, would you, would you please go in? And don't leave if he curses you and swears at you. Please don't leave. Just stand there and talk to him and wait until he gets over this ranting and shouting and screaming. So the priest said, she said, I know you're here to visit somebody, but would you do this first? So the priest, who was about probably around 35 years of age, maybe a little older, he was a kind of surprised. Um, so he walked into the room and it was a person on his own in the room and when the man, who looked very angry, looked desperate, he sat halfway up in the bed and he started screaming, foul language, cursing, saying, I don't want you, I don't want anybody in this room, and I don't want you from the church, and I don't belong to the church. And so the priest stood his ground, and he said, why are you so angry? I'm just here to give you a little blessing and to say a prayer for you. And he said, you don't know who I am. And he looked at him and the priest said back, no, I don't know who you are, but I do know that the Lord loves you and that you have to be willing to open your heart to him. And the man looked at him and said, he doesn't want anything to do with me. And the priest they got into a dialogue. And then he said to the priest, you have no idea. I spent my life in jail. I murdered a whole family. So the priest said, well, even the time you spent in jail, you did your penance, and he, you know, tried to say, and you know, Jesus can forgive. His mercy and is great. He can forgive anybody. It doesn't matter what you did. That's the power of Jesus' love for you. And the man looked at me, and he said, but you don't understand. I was a drug addict, and I was an alcoholic. And he said, many years ago, I went to work. I was a train changer. You know when the trains all coming in and out? He was, his job was to change the train on the track. He said, I fell asleep and I didn't change it. And a mother and a father and three children were just killed. And the priest looked at him. He was silent, and then he said to him, what year? Was that 1976? And he looked at him, he said, how do you know? Really, you know, how do you know it was? And he said, because that was my mother and father and my three brothers. He said, and I'm their son. He wasn't with them in the car. He was playing soccer. He was a little boy at school. And he said, I forgive you. And I'm a Catholic priest. And I can forgive you. I can through me. And the man just looked at him. He said, if I forgive you, think of what Jesus does. And the man started to cry. He just broke down. And he made the most beautiful confession. And he died the next day. But the interesting part was that the 
the priest walked out. He was very moved. And he told this friend that we know, he said, you know, for all those years, I never actually knew the circumstance. I knew that my parents were killed in an accident. I knew that it was a train, but I didn't know anything else. I was only six. And he said, but think that today I heard the confession and had the opportunity to stand for Jesus, not only in his own humanity, in his humanness, saying the words, but I forgive you. But he told the man, he said, you didn't kill, you didn't murder my parents and my, my uh, brothers. You had an addiction. There's a difference. You didn't do it intentionally. You were addicted to drugs and alcohol. And he said, he told his friend, he said, you know, his life changed. What? He was immediately the man's face. You know, it's like the soul was in torment. And this is what Jesus promised. And that's why I say to you, we all have family members who are lapsed Catholics or people who are addicted to alcohol, to drugs, whatever. I plead with you, never think that the chaplet isn't powerful because when Father walked out and he said about his own priesthood, he said, you know, it changed my life. It was the most wonderful spiritual encounter. I felt I was standing, brought all the way from Boston. That little nun had prayed the divine mercy not once a day, but numerous times. She used to visit, you know, the sick. She was an elderly nun. And she would go around the wards, you know, and just talk to them about the mercy of Jesus. And she was desperate for this one sinner, this one man. And think how God answered it, that he brought the very boy, the very priest. That's the power of divine mercy. That's what Jesus can do. And so I'd say to you, don't underestimate this mercy that is, is such a gift. Pray the divine mercy. Um, I tell people that, you know, there are many wonderful, wonderful um, divine mercy prayer groups, um, Medjugorje prayer groups, charismatic prayer groups. It's wonderful. We are living in a time when Jesus is getting us ready. There's no doubt, and I love divine mercy, I love Medjugorje. People say to me, oh, well, it's not approved by the church. Well, 99 million people. Uh, don't tell me if the devil is working, he's doing a bad job, because they're all getting converted. <laughs> Before I read you, the, share with you the next uh, short testimony, um, up here we have, these are the three you know, Pope John Paul. We know when you read the diary that John Paul was the one that the Lord had it all planned that he would bring forth into the church fully this divine mercy um, devotion. But John Paul was also a man who his first encyclical was written on mercy. But he was very prophetic. And recently I came upon this word that Pope John Paul spoke. And when I was preparing in, um, for, for coming to the Divine Mercy, it came to me, and I have used it, because, and I'm going to read it to you, because it's prophetic, and it goes along with what Jesus talks about justice and about what, when justice comes. But listen to this word now. This is from a saint. He's now Saint John Paul. And it was on his visit to the United States when he came there, I think, in the, in the 80s. But it, it is for the whole world. And these are the words that Pope St. John Paul spoke. He said, We are now standing in the face of the greatest historical confrontation humanity has ever experienced. I do not think the wide circle of American society or the wide circle of the Christian community realizes this fully. We are now facing the final confrontation between the church and the anti-church, between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between Christ 
and the Antichrist. This confrontation lies within the plan of divine providence. It is therefore in God's plan, and it must be a trial which the church must take up and face courageously. We must prepare ourselves to suffer great trials. Before long, such as will demand of us a disposition to give up even life and a total dedication to Christ and for Christ. With your prayer, yours and my prayers, it is possible to mitigate the coming tribulation, but it is no longer possible to avert it, because only thus can the church be effectively renewed. How many times has the renewal of the church sprung from the shedding of blood? This time, too, it will not be otherwise. We must be strong and prepare and trust in Christ and in his Holy Mother and be very assiduous in praying the Holy Rosary. And we would also say, and the chaplet of divine mercy. That was the Pope's words. And you know how prophetic that was in the 80s. And now you look around us. Look at our own country, Ireland. How far people are moving away from the Jesus of mercy. And yet, I have great hope. Because Mother Angelica, the nun you know her from EW10, used to say, and she often said it to me, what America needs is a good persecution. Because only when they get persecution will they get on their knees and pray. Well, you know, uh, brothers and sisters, we had the persecution. We had blood flowing in the streets. But we've forgotten, same in England. Like today is the feast of a great English martyr. And every, every, every part of the world is going through what Ireland is going through. I know of very few places that we have been where Christians are not under ferocious attack, where they're not being sidelined, where they're not being discriminated against, where they're in America, very prevalent. In the United States, if you have a young girl, which they do, we are getting lots of vocations in congregations. But, you know, families, there's wonderful Catholic families, thanks be to God. The, 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 the devotional life of the Catholic Church in America is growing. While, you know, what does it say? Where sin abounds, grace does more abound. I find the same in Ireland. That people like you, people like us, we must never lose Faith. As the Pope said, we must face courageously whatever happens because we have Jesus. And you and I know that Jesus is alive. And when people talk about how desperate everything is, I say to them, but I have good news for you. Jesus won the victory. We already know that. We already know it. Now, this is a very interesting testimony which I'm going to finish off with because it's, and Father Kevin doesn't even know I'm going to share it, but many, many years ago, I, we were on a, going down to Brazil to give a priest retreat. And the, the day before, now let me go back a bit. This family that were very close to Father Kevin and myself wonderful Catholic couple, prayed, the wife was the sarcastin in the church. We were really close friends with this family, a really good Catholic couple. Anyway, we were leaving for, um, I were leaving for South America. And in this family, there were, I think, three or four children. One of their sons, who was an engineer, had left the church, joined a cult, Became, changed his name, was in some New Age cult, which was very evil, and changed his name and um, just moved away from anything to do with God. Anyway, he lived a very promiscuous his life. The poor mother, she prayed and she prayed and she prayed, and she certainly prayed the divine mercy. Well, anyway, the e day before we're to leave for uh, one for 
Bella Resant, I think it was, or someplace in South uh, Fortaleza, to give a priest retreat. Father Kevin woke up sick, not well. So he said, well, I better not go on the plane until I feel better. So I said, he said he would join me in two days, or a day and a half or two days. When he get over whatever, I don't remember, it wasn't critical, but it was something anyway that he wanted to take care of. So I arrived down in Fortaleza to, I don't know, 120 priests. But anyway, I told them that he was coming. Well, the next day, well, I started the retreat myself, but the next day, um, he said, well, I'll, I'll come down tomorrow. I'll fly down tomorrow, you know, get his ticket. In the middle of the night, this mother had a dream and she dreamt, a vivid dream, that her son, she hadn't seen her son, she didn't exactly know, she had an idea of where he was, but she had this dream, and she saw him on his deathbed. And he, he wasn't that old, he had given up his job, he was living a very uh, sexually gay life, you know, and very, uh, very promiscuous, had nothing to do with God or anything else. But the mother sees him in a dream, screaming out on a deathbed of pain and desperation. So she contacted Father Kevin and said, Father Kevin, I'm desperate. And she found out that he was in northern Florida in a hospital dying. So she said, Nick, where would you get a priest to travel three hours and go to the deathbed? But this mother was desperate. And Father Kevin knew he had enough confidence in me that I could take care of these hundred and whatever clergymen. So he drove, they drove up to the hospital. And when they got to the hospital, around the bed were these demonic, this demonic cult chanting. And when the mother tried to go into the room, they pushed her out. But you know, it's not easy to push Father Kevin. <laughs> he doesn't take easy to people pushing him out. So he went into the room, and he would tell you himself, they, they had, when he went, oh, tried to get over there, they were chanting these demonic chants. And the fellow was in the bed, wheeling and awful. And the mother went over, and she sat the whole day, practically, saying the divine mercy over and over, because he was certainly taken over by demons. And they tried to chant louder in the room. So when they kept saying the divine, one by one, they started to leave. And in the end, there was only the priest, and Father anointed him. He went over, was ministering to him in every way, the two of them. And at a certain moment, his face just changed. And he just had the most beautiful countenance of peace. He was anointed. And, of course, he never gained consciousness. But they said the act of contrition given, you know, all on, on his deathbed. And the mother knew, and Father Kevin knew at the moment. And she said to me later, it was a terrible experience because the, the, the cult that took everything, his material things which, to bury him, they wouldn't give her anything. And somebody came and said, don't interfere with this cult because they'll kill you. But she got his ashes. That's all they gave her. And she brought them home at a Christian funeral. But she said to me, I know that the fulfillment of that prophetic word of the divine mercy, that's why God used some simple sickness, I don't know what it was, to stop Father Kevin because she, she had prayed for this son. She was desperate. And her prayer was that he would not die in this condition, that he would have salvation. Because you and I know, brothers and sisters, Life is very short. And when people talk about, oh, I don't believe in hell, somebody said, you're going to get an awful surprise and you wake up in it. <laughs> You'll soon, or when you say, I don't believe in Jesus, where do you meet him? <laughs> you know, but salvation, the only thing that matters in the end is to die a happy death, to have 
the words of Jesus on your lips, to have the sacraments, to have mercy, no matter what faith you are, to be able to cry out to Jesus. And lastly, my greatest joy in the community that I live in in Florida, we had one of our sisters whom we loved. She was a Dublin woman here. And she, my secretary's little girls, Faustina and Josephine, used to go in six and eight and said Sister Philippa was dying. She was a nurse here in Dublin. She came in her second career to Florida. She went around all the hospitals. She did wonderful work, and she used to say the divine mercy with them and bring communion and all in a parish. Well, these two little girls who know the divine, they would go up and sit on her bed in the hospice and pray the divine mercy with her. And the day she died, it was Ash Wednesday last year, my community, with my readers, we were all around the bed. I was holding her hand. She had the beads. We were saying the divine mercy. And on the last decade, she smiled and stopped breathing. And I thought, isn't that a beautiful way to go? So what I encourage you, and I say to you at the end of this sharing, when you get the opportunity to share, because Jesus did say in one of these, he said, souls who spread the honor of my mercy, I shield through their entire lives as a tender mother her infant. And at the hour of death, I will not be a judge for them, but the merciful Savior. And then he says down here, oh, what great graces I grant to souls who say this chaplet, the very depths of my tender mercy are stirred for the sake of those who say the chaplet. Write down these words, my daughter. Speak to the world about my mercy. Let all mankind recognize my unfathomable mercy. It is a sign for the end times. After it will come the day of justice. While there is still time, leave the, let them have recourse to the fountain of my mercy. Let them profit from the blood and water which gushed forth from my heart. Amen. God bless you.